this evening. Maybe we should call you the, the, the proud and the brave or uh, this evening for coming back out and being in this uh, rough weather this evening. But we're sure glad you're here. And let's everyone stand this evening as we sing our theme for this year. We're going to get a couple more weeks on this. Come and see the Lord, wonderful things which the Lord hath done for us. Looking under him, most saving. Stand, stand up for Jesus, the soldiers of the cross. stand up for the things of God. I remember a little child when I was a child, uh, sometimes I got picked on by other kids. I always had a buddy though that was a little bigger than all the other kids and when they picked on me and he was around, I just looked over and I said, hey, he's got my back. And usually they would just run off. As a Christian, when we face Satan with all the temptation, all the things that he tries to trip us up with, sometimes we need to just say, hey, Look, look who's got our back. Look what we can stand up for. And let me tell you this, if you're going to stand for something, this book right here is worth standing for. And as we saw, sang about that, I hope that encouraged your heart. And if you're here today, you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I hope on this cold, frigid night here at Mansfield Baptist Temple, you'll invite him to your, into your heart to save you from all your sins. Let's go to the Lord of Prayer at this time. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your many blessings. Thank you for your word. And thank you that it is perfect. Thank you that it is holy. And thank you that it doesn't change. 
And Lord, I pray that as Christians here tonight that we would uh, open our hearts to what the Word of God has to say. Lord, be with our pastor. Uh, fill him with your Holy Spirit. And Lord, I pray that you would speak to our hearts once again. Thank you for this warm building that we can sit in and just the comfort of our seat and just uh, uh, sit back and just listen uh, to your Word through the singing, through the preaching. And Lord, we just thank you for a place like this. We can come tonight and just be encouraged. May we be different than the way we come, in, come out of, of this place because of what you do in our lives. And Lord, help us be quick to give you the honor and praise for everything that's accomplished. Lord, thank you for your goodness that you give to us each and every day. We just want to tell you we love you. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated at this time. We have special music by our fourth through sixth graders, and they're going to sing a song entitled, Come Thou Fount. Page number 408 this evening as we sing Loyal, Loyal to Christ. at Mansfield Baptist Temple this evening, and uh, some of you, I notice, are here tonight who weren't here this morning, and I'm guessing that uh, you needed your fix, your Sunday fix, and your addiction, and uh, so you're here tonight. And by the way, that's a biblical concept. 
There's a, a, a family named the House of Stephanus, and it says they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. And I'm, I'm uh, confident that there are some people who are here tonight who say, I just need to be in church. I needed to go to church on a Sunday, and we're glad you're here. We're just crazy enough here at Mansfield Baptist Temple that our approach to the weather is this. If it's not a level three, we're having church. If you can be here, we'll look forward to it. And if you're not able to, we're not pressuring anyone to be here, but we want the doors to be open if they can. And so we're glad you chose to be here tonight. A couple of uh, announcements for you and then some prayer requests. The toppers have a meeting this Thursday, 1130. The speaker is Winnie Lanehart, longtime friend of the Kissingers, and I guess a lot, a lot of people know this lady. 52 years, she was a school teacher at all 52 at Mansfield Christian. And uh, so she's going to be here this Thursday. And uh, that, that was planned, I guess, a week ago and got canceled. So make note of that if you would. Pastor Folger's not able to be with us tonight, but I got word just before the service that uh, the uh, visiting nurse came in to see him to bandage up his hand, and he got to lead her to the Lord. And uh, he was just rejoicing in the Lord. I, I'm, I, I'm going to call him right after church tonight and just rejoice with him. So praise the Lord for that. Joe Henry contacted me. He says, family's been very ill. Ask us to continue praying. Mr. Hoover, good to see you in church tonight. He's been uh, uh, undergoing cancer treatment, and it's great that uh, he's able to be back with us. Here's a few requests that have been turned in. Marcia Anderson's sister, please pray for Mary Lou Heilman for what to do about a place to move this week and the money to do it. So pray for Marcia Anderson's sister. Continue to pray for James Elmer Fugit. He's still on life support. He's been on our prayer list. Pray for Reba Lynch. She's been having a tough time. Uh, Tom Yugovich asked us to pray for his brother, Jim who started cancer treatments last week. So pray for Jim Yugovich, Yugovich, if you would. And then Melinda Thomas asked us to pray for Kevin Ames, a friend of hers who has stage four cancer. Let's go to the Lord in prayer for our offering. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be in your house, Lord. We thank you for each one who's uh, come out tonight, Lord. And I pray that you'd meet with us. And when we leave here, we'll be able to say it's been good to have been in the house of the Lord. Lord, we thank you for this... Uh, one that Pastor Folger got to point to you today, Lord. And we thank you for the Folgers and their testimony, Lord. And even through their difficulty, they're still remaining true and pointing others to you. And I thank you for that, Lord. I pray that you continue to bless them, Lord. We thank you that uh, John Hoover is able to be back with us, Lord. I pray you continue to strengthen him. I pray that you would be with um, each of these other requests, Lord. I pray that you would meet each of the needs. And we'll thank you for it, Lord. And I pray that you would bless this offering as it's taken, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.
March is coming up soon, and March is Stewardship Month at Mansfield Baptist Temple. And during Stewardship Month, we will be uh, preparing some messages talking about stewarding your finances. In preparation for that, we have a course that we're going to be offering here, and it's uh, titled Financial Peace University. And tonight, in, the, in uh, just about three or four minute video that we have, that's a little bit of a promotional for that. So we're going to show that at this time. For 20 years, families have been changing their futures through Financial Peace University. I started it with a bad suit and overhead projector. I set the room for 135 people, four people came. And now today we've had over one and a half million families go through this course. That's over two million people across this nation. You may be wondering, what is it? What Financial Peace University is about is a return to God's ways of handling money, but in a very practical, step-by-step -step game plan showing you exactly how to do it. FPU is about learning how to control your money. When you make these dollars behave, you're going to get this sense of power over your money that you've never, ever had. Don't move into a home with 62 debts or six debts or, or two debts and no money. You move into a home broke with a bunch of debt around your neck, Murphy will move in your spare bedroom, bring his three cousins broke, desperate, and stupid. Marriages are being made stronger. Couples are learning how to talk to each other about money and getting on the same page. The closest statistical correlation to success going through this program are those that actively engage in this budgeting process and for those that are married they're doing it together. You change your life when you get sick and tired of being sick and tired. When you get disgusted and you have that moment where you say, I've had it! I'm not going to live like this anymore! We're done! We're changing this thing! Talk about the why. Talk about your dreams. Ask your spouse, what would we do? Where would we travel to? What would we buy? What would be changed if we became something as a couple where we were working together on that? Now, man, I'm sure you know this, and we've been talking about it for the last few minutes, but it's very true. Women are different, aren't they? Say yes. yes. One of the things you may or may not know is they have a gland right in here that you don't have. It's called the security gland. And when she is feeling insecure due to money issues, that gland spasms and it is attached to her face. This nine lesson, 90 minute class will challenge you. Now this is a boot camp. I'm your coach. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you uncomfortable sometimes. You're going to go home and go, I don't really like him tonight. Now if I agree with that, which would make you wrong. That's what happens when the coach coaches you, doesn't it? He kind of rubs you the wrong way. There's a little friction on there, right? I've had some good coaches, and they lit me up a time or two, but it caused me to go places I couldn't go otherwise. Life change is never easy, but you won't be alone. You'll watch a DVD each week and discuss it with your small group. Your classmates will encourage you and help you take those first steps. You'll walk away from FPU knowing how to relate with money. You'll learn how to pay off debt and save for the future. And you'll learn how to protect your plan. We aren't born knowing everything we need to about money. We learn. And there's no better place to learn than the Word. The Bible offers more than 800 scriptures on money, and Financial Peace University is based on that solid foundation. You are literally going to be doing things every week differently than you ever have based on biblical principles. Uh, things like doing a budget, things like working with your spouse, things like singles having an accountability partner, things like teaching your kids so that a godly man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. It's not theory. This is actual application on everything. What would happen if the people of God started handling money God's ways? What would happen? If the, what would happen to the kingdom of God if the people of God were out of debt? All you need is a plan. Financial Peace University is that plan.
Let's everyone stand once again this evening as we sing page number 401, Where He Leads, I'll Follow. so much. Just before the message this evening, we have Cassidy Greenwood come sing for us, Who Am I? Because of who I am 
because of what you've done Not because of what I've done But because of who you are I am a flower quickly fading Here today and gone tomorrow A wave tossed in the ocean A vapor in the wind Still you hear me when I'm calling Lord, you catch me when I'm falling And you've told me who I am I am yours, I am yours. Exodus chapter 14, Exodus chapter 14. <clears throat> Thank you, Cassie, appreciate that song. The music, Financial Peace Universe, we showed a little bit of a clip of a video there, it's shown across America, a lot of churches have shown that, and uh, we think that it is, uh, can be really valuable for our church. We'll be giving you some more information, but I think March the 16th is the uh, first class for that, and you'll get some information on how to sign up for that. Mrs. Debbie Custer is uh, kind of heading that up for us, and so we appreciate her help with that, and I may be able to answer some more questions that you may have. Exodus chapter 14, we are in our third week of a series titled Real People Facing Real Life. Real people facing real life. We looked the first week at a guy named Joseph, and we did a little bit of an overview of Joseph. The message was titled Reacting to Being Wronged. And we watched Joseph, and in Joseph's life, he was wronged repeatedly, and every time his reaction was correct. <clears throat> Last week, we looked at a guy named Noah. Noah. The message was titled, Consistency Amidst Criticism. A hundred years he was working on this ark. And I can imagine the criticism he got through those years. Just consistent. Just kept on going. But tonight, we're looking at a little bit of a different guy. This guy's a little bit of a different approach. There's a lot more in the scripture about him. Maybe, maybe 250 to 300 chapters are about this guy. His name's Moses. There's a lot in the scripture about him. What I'm going to read for you here is the first, four, uh, first 12 verses of chapter 14. This is late in his life. So we're going to read this and then we're going to go back and we'll walk through a little bit of his life and see what we can learn from real people facing real life, a guy named Moses. The Bible says in Exodus 14, verse 1, of the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they turn and encamp before Mihahiroth, between Migdal and the sea over against Baal Zephon. Before it shall ye encamp by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, They are entangled in the land. The wilderness hath shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, that he shall follow after them. And I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon, and upon all his host, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. And it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled. And the heart of Pharaoh and of his servants was turned against the people. And they said, Why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? <clears throat> In this story here, the Israelites have gotten out of Egypt, and now the Egyptians are saying, hey, we shouldn't have let them go. We should have kept him here as our servants. So they speak to the king of Egypt, and they say, why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from us? And he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. And he took 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt and captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he pursued after the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with an high hand. But the Egyptians pursued after them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen, his army, and overtook them. And camping by the sea beside Behahiroth before Baal Zephon. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. And they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord, and they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us, to carry us forth out of Egypt? 
Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. In these 12 verses that we read, the Lord is speaking to Moses, and he's trying to direct Moses. And we read a little bit further, and here come the people, and they're talking to Moses, and they're trying to direct Moses. And they don't like the approach Moses has taken. You ever have that in your life? The Lord's speaking in one ear and someone else is giving you a totally different advice in the other ear. Real people facing real life. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this account of the life of Moses. And as we study it, Lord, I pray that you would show us what you would have for us to learn. Lord, we thank you for each one who's come into your house tonight. I pray your blessing upon them, Lord. I pray that we will be ready to receive your word. And we'll thank you for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> when you begin studying the life of Moses, you see it all. There's no cover-up with this guy named Moses. We see his best day. We see his worst day. We see him on the mountaintop. We see him in the valley. We see his triumph. We see his tragedy. Real people facing real life. Sometimes I don't know what it's like for you, but my wife and I have had this discussion many times. We try to take people and put them in a box. Good box, bad box. <clears throat> have you noticed that not very many people fit in the box? They just don't fit there. Moses didn't fit comfortably there either. Moses, he struggled in some areas. There's much to learn from his faults. He was remarkably successful in other areas. There's much to learn from his positive qualities. So over the next few minutes, I want to give you eight simple lessons to learn from the life of Moses. And we're going to start in Exodus chapter 2. In Exodus chapter 2. I titled these simple lessons, and you'll see why. <clears throat> Exodus chapter 2, beginning in verse 11, we read, And it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, that he went out unto his brethren and looked on their burdens. And he spied an Egyptian smiting an Hebrew, one of his brethren. And he looked this way and that way. And when he saw that there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Lesson number one, looking this way and that way is neglecting the only important way to look, up. He looked this way and he looked that way and all was clear. And so he went ahead and he slew a guy. He forgot to look up. Interestingly, the Bible says in verse 13, and when he went out the second day, Behold, two men of the Hebrews strove together, and he said to them that did the wrong, Wherefore smitest thou thy fellow? And he said, Who made thee a prince and a judge over us? Intendest thou to kill me as thou killest the Egyptian? You know how long Moses got away with his sin? One day. One day! I mean, he looked this way and he looked that way and nobody was around. And so he goes ahead and commits the sin and he got away with it for one whole day. You know what he forgot to do? He forgot to look up. By the way, it can be done. There's another story of a guy named Joseph and this woman tried to seduce him and he didn't look that way and he didn't look that way. You know which way he looked? That way. And he said, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Simple lesson. Looking this way and that way is neglecting the only important way to look, and that is up. Number two. As we walk through this guy's life, I want to take you to Acts chapter 7, and we learn something interesting about him. Acts chapter 7. <clears throat> In Acts chapter 7, Stephen is speaking, and he's giving a history of Israel. And we learn quite a bit that we didn't know before about Israel. In verse 20 of Acts chapter 7, it says, In which time Moses was born, and was exceeding fair, and nourished up in his father's house three months. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. Now, we know the story of Moses. When Moses was a little boy, Pharaoh was trying to kill all the Egyptian boys. And so Pharaoh's, or, um, Moses' parents 
put him in this little uh, container and they put him in the water. And Pharaoh's daughter came down and she found him. And the Bible says she nourished him for her own son. But I want you to look at verse 22. It says, and Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. Now watch how it describes Moses. And was mighty in words and in deeds. Now, if you know your Bible very well, that ought to be a little bit disconcerting to you when it says Moses was mighty in words and in deeds. And when he was full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. It tells the story that we just read a little bit about. Go down to verse 30, and it says, And when 40 years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in the flame of fire and a bush. Now, here's what I want you to see in this story. Moses was 40 years old. And when he was 40 years old, he was described in this way. He was nourished up by Pharaoh's daughter as her own son. And then he was described as mighty in words and in deeds. After spending 40 years in the desert, the Lord came to him and said, I got a job for you to go and do take my people Israel out of Egypt. And guess what Moses said was the reason he couldn't go. He couldn't speak. Lesson number two. Sometimes the wilderness is exactly what we need to humble and prepare us for great service for the Lord. Sometimes the wilderness is exactly what we need to humble and prepare us for great service for the Lord. He started out, he was mighty in that, and he got done. He says, man, I can't even talk. You know what I believe the Lord was telling him? Hey, whatever you're mighty in, that doesn't impress me. It's me that's going to work through you. And by the time he got done, he says, I I can't talk very well. Go back to Exodus chapter 4. And we'll see our third point, Exodus chapter 4. In Exodus chapter 4, the Lord has come to him. The Lord has said, I want you to be in charge. Verse 10 says this, And Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent. Exodus 4.10, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? Or who maketh the dumb or deaf or the seeing or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth and teach thee what thou shalt say. Third simple lesson is this. No impediment is an obstacle when God is directing. No impediment is an obstacle when God is directing. You know what we have a tendency to do sometimes? Well, I would serve the Lord, but I've got this problem. I don't speak very well. I'm kind of shy. I've got a bad past. I, you know what we ought to do is say, Lord, what would you like me to do? and I'll go through your power. No impediment is an obstacle when God is directing. Number four, we're going to see this pattern in his life repeatedly, and we'll stop here for a minute. Number four is this. A temper makes one weak and vulnerable. A temper makes one weak and vulnerable. We read in Exodus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, how he saw this and he just lost it. He just goes ahead and kills this guy. Go over to Exodus chapter 32 and we'll see his temper again. In Exodus chapter 32, he's been up on Mount Sinai. He's gotten the tablets from the Lord. The Lord wrote in the, uh, into rock and he gave them these tablets. And he came down from the mount in verse 15 of Exodus 32. And Moses turned and went down from the mount. And the two tables of the testimony were in his hand. The tables were written on both their sides. And on the one side and on the other were they written. And the tables were the work of God. And the writing was the writing of God graven upon the tables. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, There is a noise of war in the camp. And he said, it is not the voice of them that shout for mastery. Neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome. But the noise of them that sing do I hear. 
Look at verse 19. It came to pass as soon as he came nigh unto the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing. And Moses' anger waxed hot, and he cast the tables out of his hands and brake them beneath the mount. Here Moses let his temper get control of him again, and he got so mad that he broke the tablets that the Lord had written. You say, well, but they, he saw sin, and that made him upset. Yes, it did. But do you believe it would be right for him to take what God had done there and to break that because of it? A temper makes one weak and vulnerable. Hatred of sin is not a plausible reason to lose one's temper. Parents, parents, I'm speaking to myself. When our children misbehave and we lose it, that is not appropriate. It's not appropriate for us to lose our temper because of our children. Hatred of sin is not a plausible reason to lose one's temper. Moses' temper ultimately cost him dearly. If you do not know the story, let's go to Numbers chapter 20, and we'll see what happened because of no, uh, Moses' temper. The Bible says in Numbers 20 and verse 7, Numbers 20 and verse 7 says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Numbers 27, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the rod, and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth his water, and thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock. So shalt thou give the congregation and their beast drink. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord, as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock, and he said unto them, Hear now, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice. And the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beasts also. But if you go back to verse 8, he said to take the rod, but then he said, speak unto the rock. And Moses lost his temper with the people, and he says, Hear now, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? And he took the rod and he smote the rock. The Bible says in verse 12, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, Because ye believed me not, to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. This is the water of Meribah, because the children of Israel strove with the Lord, and he was sanctified in them. Take your Bible now and go to Psalm 106. Psalm 106. We'll see a little bit more about this temper. Psalm 106, verse 32 Psalm 106, verse 32 says, They angered him also at the waters of strife, so that it went ill with Moses for their sakes, because they provoked his spirit, so that he spake unadvisedly with his lips. Now let me take you one more spot, Numbers 27. Numbers 27. This right here had to be so difficult for Moses, and what a lesson he needed to learn about this temper. The Bible says in Numbers 27 and verse 12, And the Lord said unto Moses, Get thee up into this mount of Byram, and see the land which I have given unto the children of Israel. And when thou hast seen it, thou also shalt be gathered unto thy people as Aaron thy brother was gathered. For ye rebelled against my commandment in the, in the desert of Zin, in the strife of the congregation to sanctify me at the water before their eyes, that is the water of Meribah and Kadesh in the wilderness of Zin. In this situation, the Lord said, I want you to go and I want you to look over the land. And when you've gotten done seeing it, then it's going to be time for you to die. Hear that temper cost him dearly. 
You know, in our lives, sometimes we can get a temper, and oh, maybe sometimes it doesn't cost us too much. But there was an occasion here where it cost him dearly. The Bible teaches us that when we have no rule over our spirit, we're like a city that is broken down and without walls. What the Bible is saying there in Proverbs chapter 25 is that when, when we don't have control over our spirit, when we lose it, we're weak and vulnerable. We're like a city that's broken down and without walls. You know, the cities back then had the walls around them, and those walls around them were, were their protection. They would build those walls so they'd be protected from the enemy. And he says, if you don't have control over your spirit, you're like a city that's broken down and without walls. Simple lesson for us to learn. A temper makes one weak and vulnerable. Now I take you back to Exodus chapter 14. Exodus chapter 14. Now we're later in Moses' life. The Lord speaks to him. The Lord tells him, I want you to go into Egypt. I want you to take my people out of Egypt. You're going to lead them out. And he goes in and he has these contests with Pharaoh and all these plagues come upon Pharaoh and the Egyptians. And finally they say, get out. And so they go and they begin to go. And the Bible tells us at the beginning of chapter 14 that the Lord told them exactly where to go. He gave them the destination that he wanted to give them. He sent them right to a spot. And if you were to look that spot up on a map, he, he sent them right to a spot that when Pharaoh came, they were stuck. Don't miss the fact that the Lord was the one who took them to that spot. He directed them there. They got there, and here comes Pharaoh with his hosts. Number five, sometimes God places us where only he can provide for us. Sometimes God places us where only he can provide for us. It may be that you've gotten yourself in this predicament and you say, boy, I've been doing what I believe the, the Bible says. I've been trying to do what God wants me to do and I'm in this difficult spot. It may be the Lord has taken you right there so that only he can provide for you. I want to tell you what happened here. We read verses 11 and 12 where the Israelites began to complain. But I want you to read now verse 13 of Exodus 14. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you to you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. Ah, oh, Moses said, hey, I'm just doing what the Lord wants me to do. I'm just walking the path he wanted me. He told us to come here. Let's stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And wow, what a salvation it was. If you go over to the end of this chapter, the Bible says in verse 29, you know the story. I think you would know the story where the waters parted and they walked through and then the uh, Egyptians began to come through chasing them on the dry land under the water and all of a sudden the waters came back together. Verse 29 says, but the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea. The waters were a wall unto them on the right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians. Now look at this. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. And Israel saw that great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians. And the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. Sometimes God places us where only he can provide for us. Lesson number six. Go to Deuteronomy chapter one. Deuteronomy chapter one. As I was putting these lessons together, I purposely put them bad, good, bad, good. You know why I did that? Because that's indicative of our own lives, isn't it? Sometimes we see, and we're, boy, we're up here, and the next day we're down here. That's what real life's like sometimes. Sometimes there are difficulties. Sometimes there are failures. What a pretty picture Exodus 14 was. But when we come to Deuteronomy chapter 1 and verse 37, Moses is speaking. He says, also the Lord was angry with me for your sake, saying, thou also shalt not go in thither. Lesson number six is this. Mulligans are not a choice. 
mulligans are not a choice. For those of you who don't golf and don't know what a mulligan is, that's a do-over. So if you don't like the word mulligan, throw in the word do-over. Mulligans are not a choice. Look over at chapter 3 of Deuteronomy, chapter 3, beginning in verse 23. Deuteronomy 3.23 says, And I besought the Lord at that time, saying, O Lord God, thou hast begun to show thy servant thy greatness and thy mighty hand. For what God is there in heaven or on earth that can do according to thy works and according to thy might? I pray thee, I pray thee, let me go over and see the good land that is beyond Jordan, that goodly mountain and Lebanon. He says, Lord, you've been so good. You've been so great. I love you. I love what you've done. Please let me go. I know you said I can't go, but I'm just asking you, can I go? But the Lord was wroth with me for your sakes and would not hear me. And the Lord said unto me, let it suffice thee, Speak no more unto me of this matter. Get thee up into the top of Pisgah, and lift up thine eyes westward, and northward, and southward, and eastward, and behold it with thine eyes. For thou shalt not go over this Jordan, but charge Joshua, and encourage him, and strengthen him. For he shall go over before this people, and he shall cause them to inherit the land which thou shalt see. Mulligans! are not a choice. I think we all understand that we serve a forgiving God, and I'm so thankful for that. But we would be remiss to believe that forgiveness, we would be remiss to not recognize that forgiveness is not the absence of consequences. We better see that forgiveness is not the absence of consequences. I believe God forgave him for that. I believe he was truly repentant. But God said, you don't get a do-over. And in our lives, there are going to be situations where we do something we ought not. And we're not going to get a do-over. I wrote this thought down this afternoon. I said, mulligans are not a choice. If they were, I would be spending my entire life on whole one. Isn't that true? I'll take a mulligan. I'll take another one. Real life, real people, we don't have mulligans. Number seven, Numbers chapter 12. Numbers chapter 12. Numbers chapter 12 and verse 3, we read this. Numbers 12, 3. Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. What a description of Moses. The man Moses was very meek above all the men upon the face of the earth. Moses, number seven, Moses is forever remembered by this attribute, meek, meek. Let me show you why this is such a beautiful attribute. Go to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28, Jesus is speaking. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is like light. Do you realize why meekness is such a great attribute? Because it's an attribute of Jesus Christ. Turn over to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. Verse 1 says, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, 
But let it, look at verse 4, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit which is in the sight of God of great price. Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. Meekness, humble, lowly in mind. Meekness, you've heard this maybe before. Meekness is not weakness, but is power under control. Meekness. Let me give you one last lesson, and we'll find this in Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. You want to learn a little bit about Moses. You can learn in Hebrews chapter 11, beginning in verse 23, when we read these words. Uh, Hebrews eleven twenty three 23 says, By faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child, and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Here's Moses. Here's Moses in a nutshell. The Bible says that Moses was taken by Pharaoh's daughter. He was then in line to have great authority, great wealth, to have everything you could dream of having. And the Bible says he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Here's what the Bible says then in verse 26. The Bible uses the word esteeming. That's a, a word similar to the word account. He made an accounting here. Here was the accounting that he made. He said, here's the reproach of Christ. Here are all the treasures in Egypt. The reproach of Christ is more valuable than all the treasures in Egypt. And then it says this, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. You know what that tells us about that guy? He saw long term. He saw long term. Here's my last simple lesson for you about Moses. And it's the simplest of all. Ready? God chose to use Moses. God chose to use him. He was a real man. He had difficulties in his life. He sinned. The Bible just... There's no cover-up here, is there? I mean, we just see it all. But do you know something? God chose to use that guy. Is it possible that God would desire to use you? Would God want to use you? Are there some things in Moses' life you say, hey, that's a lesson I need to learn. That's an adjustment I need to make. Real people facing real life. Moses, boy, he had a temper. And that temper cost him dearly. You have a temper, and you say, you know what, Lord, it's time for me to bring that here to the altar and leave it there. I don't want to be known by that anymore. Are you like Moses? And you say, boy, I've been using excuses. I've got a whole list of them. I'm not eloquent. I, I just can't speak. How about coming to this altar and saying, Lord... I'm just going to let myself be used by you. And whatever power I have is going to come through you. God chose to use Moses. And do you know he would like to use each one of us? He doesn't want a Christian who says, I'll just sit on the sideline. Oh, I've got a past. Oh, I've... No, he wants to use every one of us. Let's stand for...